In his new book, Oscar Wars, A History of Hollywood in Gold, Sweat, and Tears, Michael Shulman writes about the -the behind-the-scenes battles we don't see on the night Hollywood celebrates itself. He says, quote, The Oscars have become a conflict zone for issues of race, gender, and representation, high-profile signifiers of whose stories get told and whose don't. In previous decades, Oscar wars were waged over different issues, but they were no less fraught, unquote. The very existence of the Oscars and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which administers them, were created in an attempt to resolve a conflict in young Hollywood back in the late 1920s. The conflict Shulman writes about involved labor battles, World War II, anti-communist hysteria and blacklists, old Hollywood versus new Hollywood, the Me Too movement, Oscars so white, the zillions of dollars spent on campaigning for Oscars, and of course, greed and ego. Shulman has written for The New Yorker since 2006. Among the people he's written about are Pedro Almodovar, Emma Thompson, Elizabeth Moss, Adam Driver, and Jeremy Strong. He's also the author of a book about Meryl Streep. Shulman is so into the Oscars, he co-created an annual live series called You Like Me, an evening of classic acceptance speeches, an event at which he has actors read classic Oscar acceptance speeches. Michael Shulman, welcome to Fresh Air. Thanks for having me. Yes, I learned a lot of interesting stuff from your book. So there's different chapters of history that I want to cover with you. But let's start with the Oscars So White movement. And um, that's echoing this year, too. Explain how. Well, this year, the big Oscar controversy so far has been the surprise nomination of Andrea Riseborough for Best Actress. This was a out-of-nowhere campaign during the short nomination window uh, in January. Suddenly, there was this social media campaign by A-list actors like Edward Norton, Jennifer Aniston, trying to make sure Academy voters remembered Andrea Riseborough and Two Leslie. Now, this was a tiny little movie that had been released in the fall, and uh, very few people saw it. It made about as much money as it takes to buy a, a new Honda Civic. So it, she was not in the you know the quote unquote conversation, and yet um, because uh, this groundswell of support came uh, from high-profile people. Um, It was a very unusual way to campaign. The the craziest thing about it is that it worked, and she was nominated for Best Actress for To Leslie. Um, Meanwhile, um, two black actresses uh, who had been very much in the conversation, uh, Viola Davis in The Woman King and uh, Danielle Deadweiler in Till, were not nominated. And, you know, it's not really a kind of one person replaces another situation, but of course it's, you know, it, it brought up all these issues of of equity and representation at the Oscars and, you know, opened up this question of does a black actress like Danielle Deadweiler have the network of support within the industry that an uh, Andrea Riseborough is? And, you know, this is a conversation that has gone back decades with the Academy Awards. Um, you know, they they always fail as a sort of pure barometer of you know, artistic merit or or worth. There are a million other factors that go into who gets nominated and who wins. Let's talk about the Academy's reaction to Oscar So White. It kind of changed uh, the voting rules a bit. What were the changes? The real thing that changed was the makeup of the membership. So in 2016, for the second year in a row, all of the 20 acting nominees were white. And uh, an activist named April Rain had started a hashtag the year before, which was uh, hashtag Oscars so white, they asked to touch my hair. And, you know, that got some pickup in 2015. In 2016, it went absolutely viral. And uh, there was a lot of attention paid to the incredible uh, whiteness and maleness of the people who are in the Academy and who do the voting. So, um, the Academy Board of Directors had an emergency meeting, and um, the president of the Academy at the time was Cheryl Boone Isaacs, who was uh, the first black president. And um, basically what they did was fast-tracked a plan they had been discussing to 
actively try to diversify the membership. So um, they invited uh, an, an unprecedented number of new people in, and it was more people of color, more women, younger people, and uh, also more international people. At the same time, they uh, had this policy where if you hadn't been active in the industry for many years, uh, you would be demoted to emeritus status, this this amazing kind of euphemism, which meant that basically you could not vote anymore. And this just set off a, a complete panic in Hollywood. Of course, there are a lot of people who praised what the Academy was doing, but then there was a very loud subsection of people who were just totally freaked out and felt that they were being blamed, that they were being uh, scapegoated as as racist. And, uh, you know, it became a real a, a real conflict. So do you think those changes have made a difference? And has the controversy over those changes died down? It has made a difference. I mean, one of the underappreciated things about these reforms uh, was that the Academy became much more international. And I think you start to see that reflected in a win like Parasite a few years ago. Uh, The Academy's uh, assessment of movies has become uh, much less hemmed in by... Hollywood as a as a physical place, um, but of course the controversy has not died down, uh, and we see that this year with uh, with the best actress category. You know this is a great year for Asian nominees. Um, you know Michelle Yeoh and uh, Hong Chao, uh, all the you know people from Everything Everywhere All at Once, um, and yet there is still no a black actress nominated. There has not been a, a best. Uh, actress winner uh, who's a person of color since Halle Berry won the first and only one in in 2002 and uh, there are no female directors nominated this year so I think this is not a problem that's been solved like you know the larger issue in American life over inclusion and representation it's kind of an ongoing battle well, let's go back to 1970 when there was a different battle over inclusion and this was a conflict that that you frame as the conflict between old Hollywood and new Hollywood. So what what were the films that were in conflict in 1970, the year that you write about, when there was a real clash between the old school and the new Hollywood? That's right. I mean, so there was this incredible year. In the year before, 1969, the Best Picture winner was Oliver, which was the only G-rated movie to win uh, the top prize. Uh, the, the whole rating system was new at that time. Um, so it was the first and only G-rated uh, winner. And then one year later, Midnight Cowboy became the first and only X-rated winner uh, to win Best Picture. Um, and at the same time, some of the nominees were uh, well, like Easy Rider, which really became an emblem of you know, the sort of rising counterculture of, of the 60s and 70s. And so you had this ceremony where you know, people like Bob Hope and John Wayne were up there talking about how you know, every one of the movies is naked or on drugs now, and they were kind of scandalized. And then, um, and then people like Dennis Hopper, who rolled into the Academy Awards uh, wearing a Stetson. And, you know, it was a real uh, meeting of of worlds. Uh, Now, at the time, Gregory Peck was the president of the Academy. And um, like the Academy leadership in 2016, he realized that there was a real gap, that movies were not speaking to you know, the youth quake of, of the 60s uh, to the counterculture. Uh, and the Academy was particularly behind the times. Um, so what he did was uh, put in this initiative, uh, much like, you know, the more recent one, to update the membership. And uh, he did a lot of outreach to, you know, people like Dustin Hoffman and, you know, Dennis Hopper, or Peter Fonda, people who were like the up-and-coming countercultural uh, figures of the time. And then... Um, then as now created a policy where if you hadn't been active for seven years, you would be uh, demoted to uh, a non-voting membership. And exactly the same way, he got angry letters. You know, I went through his files at the Academy Museum and he preserved every outraged letter from, you know, old timers who thought that they were being pushed aside, you know, people who had worked on Abbott and Costello movies in the 30s. Another interesting thing, like you write in this chapter about Bob Hope's 
um, comments during the ceremony because he was hosting. He hosted for years. And at the beginning, or toward the beginning of the ceremony, he said, this will go down in history as the cinema season which proved that crime doesn't pay, but there's a fortune in adultery, incest, and homosexuality. This is not Academy Awards. It's a freak out. And he ended the ceremony after Midnight Cowboy won his best film by saying, never again will Hollywood be accused of showing a lollipop world, perhaps by showing the nitty gritty, by giving the world a glimpse of the elements of violence and its destructive effect. It will help cool it. More and more films have explored the broad spectrum of human experience. They have fearlessly and for the most part with excellent taste examined behavior long considered taboo. How did he go from totally mocking films that dealt with um, open marriages, incest, homosexuality, to like praising (laughs) those films for their fearlessness? Yeah, isn't it fascinating? I I think you can see him kind of reckoning with this sea change in Hollywood and in popular culture. Um, you know, and, and and at the end, he kind of justifies it by saying, well, maybe if we see these characters, you know, do these depraved things on the screen, it will inspire us, you know, not to do them in real life. You know, he was sort of searching for kind of the moral, you know, justification for a, a movie like Midnight Cowboy existing. But I mean, I find that so fascinating. And in a way, what I tried to do in the book is take certain years of the Oscars and like put them on the couch and, you know, psychoanalyze yeah, yeah. them. <laughs> uh, I, I, and these moments of transition uh, and these moments of instability are always so fascinating. I mean, th- just that year, you know, seeing a Bob Hope uh, reckon with the fact that this X rated movie about a hustler. When, you know, it, it's, you know, we felt that when Moonlight won a few years ago over over La La Land in that crazy envelope mix up. And, you know, you could sense that, OK, so this means something, you know, it's just one movie. It's just one win. But it means the culture, you know, you can sense the culture kind of changing in this tectonic way. Let's talk about campaigning for Oscars because it's become, as you write, it's become a cottage industry. Give us a sense of how big the industry is lobbying for Oscars. Right. Well, in a way, it's a bit similar to a presidential campaign. Um, You know, you have um, campaign strategists and publicists and people who spend the entire year uh, working on campaign strategizing, uh, placing ads, entering films and film festivals, um, and sort of positioning movies and appealing to particular Academy members. Um, you see presidential uh, candidates, you know, going to different primary states like, you know, New Hampshire, South Carolina. The movie version of that is, you know, all of these precursor awards like the Golden Globes, the SAGs, the, you know, the BAFTAs, uh, this kind of run up. Um, There are also like events throughout the year where, you know, a presidential candidate might, you know, go to the, you know, a state fair in New Hampshire uh, and, you know, eat some corn on the cob. Uh, the, the movie star version of that is, you know, going to the Santa Barbara Film Festival to be honored or going to a cocktail party. Um, and, of course, the Academy has all sorts of rules and guidelines surrounding what people can and can't do. And they basically make up these rules to catch up with whatever, you know, the, the campaign strategists uh, invent. And that leads us to Harvey Weinstein because he, as you put it, he turned campaigning for Oscars into a blood sport. What are some of the things that he did that no one had done before? Well, before uh, Harvey Weinstein really had his rise in the 90s at Miramax, um, you know, Oscar campaigning would be placing ads in the trade magazines, you know, for your consideration ads and variety or whatever. Um, and, you know, people having, you know, maybe some private screenings at their homes in Beverly Hills. Uh, what Weinstein did was basically leave no stone unturned. He would not just blanket, uh, you know, the airways and the papers with advertisements, but he would, um, for instance, find out where particular Academy members lived. And if there were, you know, three people in the Academy who happened to live in Santa Fe, he'd, uh, he'd have people call them and set up a, a screening there and make sure they went. And, you know, he would find little pockets of Academy members. And uh, and, and there were just nonstop, uh, you know, events, parties, uh, hoopla. Um, he also had a real uh, gift for sort of 
creating stunts that would get publicity. You know, for instance, he had a when, when uh, the English patient was out, and he staged an entire evening at at town hall in New York City with you know people reading from the book and and music, and but then he would also um, find ways to sort of create humanitarian campaigns out of his movies. You know, uh, famously, you know, My Left Foot with Daniel Day Lewis. Um, he brought the movie and Daniel Day Lewis to Washington, and you know, screened the movie for senators. Um, the campaigns, though, didn't always really quite fit the movie. You know, uh, more recently, um, Silver Linings Playbook uh, was one of his movies, and he sort of spun this campaign that it was, you know, a, a really serious movie about mental health, which it, it kind of isn't. Talk a little bit about the campaigns between Saving Private Ryan, the Spielberg World War II film, and Shakespeare in Love, the comedy about Shakespeare that was produced by Weinstein's company, Miramax. What are some of the things that Weinstein did in that campaign that were unprecedented? Well, so this was 1999, and this has just gone down in history as the ugliest best picture fight of all time. An important part of that story is DreamWorks, which was uh, Steven Spielberg's studio. Um, DreamWorks was founded in 1994 by Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and David Geffen. So it was it was really these these three bigwigs, um, and uh, they were on the cover of Time Magazine. Everyone was so excited. This was the first major Hollywood studio in you know decades and decades. Um, and it took them a few years to actually put out a movie that was a huge success. The, you know, Saving Private Ryan. It was Spielberg's big World War II movie that was a tribute to his own father's generation, and his father had uh, fought in the war. And it came out in the summer of 1998. It was a gigantic success, a critical a darling, and it was presumed to be the front runner for for Best Picture for many months. And then in December, along came. Shakespeare in Love from Harvey Weinstein's Miramax. And it was really such a different kind of movie. It was frothy and fun and clever and romantic. Um, and it was about art, not war, and love, not, you know, death. And as we've seen many, many years of the Oscar, the, a sort of front runner fatigue sets in. And so people were suddenly interested in this, this new dynamic. Um, and then what Weinstein did uh, with Miramax was push every conceivable angle he could with this movie. Like, there were tons of ads. As he was throwing parties. The thing that really made this campaign so ugly was that DreamWorks got word through the grapevine that Weinstein was negative campaigning against Saving Private Ryan, that he was saying to journalists that they should write that essentially Saving Private Ryan was only good for the first 25 minutes, you know, the, the famous D-Day sequence. And uh, and after that was basically a, a, a run-of-the-mill World War II movie. Um, and so this got to DreamWorks. DreamWorks was absolutely furious. Um, they started complaining to the press about everything Miramax was doing. Uh, Harvey Weinstein denied, denied, denied. Um, and it sounds familiar. And, um, and, it's, and, and the people who worked for him didn't necessarily know what he was doing all the time. And so they felt that they were just being smeared by DreamWorks. And by the time everyone got to Oscar night, there was so much resentment and enmity between these two studios. And um, people still thought that uh, Saving Private Ryan would win. And then Spielberg won Best Director. Uh, Harrison Ford came out to present Best Picture, so the DreamWorks people thought, "Oh my gosh, it's Indiana Jones! Of course, it'll be it'll be Saving Private Ryan." But Shakespeare in Love won, and it was just this explosion of uh, shock and, uh, and and recrimination. And uh, the the head of uh, marketing at DreamWorks, Terry Press, uh, says that she was in the mezzanine watching and that she felt like her face was on fire. Um, and the next day in the New York Times, there was an article about uh, executives in Hollywood complaining that Weinstein had turned Oscar campaigning in, into, you know, a, a, something that has, just has to do with money and politicking and that he had sort of cheapened the whole process. Um, as it turns out, in the end, someone tallied up the ads and found out that Saving Private Ryan had actually placed more ads in the trades than than Shakespeare in Love, but that sort of didn't matter at that point because everybody was so resentful of how uh, Weinstein had changed the paradigm. So talking about Harvey Weinstein leads us directly into the Me Too movement. But first, let's take a short break here. If you're just joining us, my guest is Michael Shulman, and he's the author 
of the new book, Oscar Wars. We'll talk more after we take a short break. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Hi, this is Molly C.V. Nesper, producer at Fresh Air. And this is Seth Kelly, also a producer at Fresh Air. If you like the Fresh Air podcast, we think there's a pretty good chance that you'll also like the Fresh Air newsletter. It's a weekly newsletter written by us, the people who help make the show. You'll get all the week's interviews and reviews in one place. Plus, staff recommendations, interviews from the archive, bonus audio, and what's coming up on the show. Imagine an email you enjoy getting. To subscribe, go to whyy.org slash fresh air. Let's get back to my interview with Michael Shulman, author of the new book, Oscar Wars, a history of Hollywood in gold, sweat, and tears. And it's about all the behind the scenes battles since the founding of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences over the Oscars and over who gets to vote, all those behind the scenes conflicts. So we were talking about how Harvey Weinstein changed how people campaign for Oscars, making it a much more aggressive, much more expensive campaign. Talking about Harvey Weinstein leads us directly into the Me Too movement and its impact on the Oscars. And one of those impacts is that Harvey Weinstein was expelled from the Academy because of his sexual harassment and sexual assaults. Um, But that led to some interesting problems for the Academy about what about other people who were accused of sexual harassment or assault or who were found to have actually committed those acts. Talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, people said at the time, you know, what about uh, Roman Polanski or so-and-so? Um, what's interesting about the last couple years is that Hollywood and movie fans, you know, us, the public, um, have really started to reckon more and more with, you know, these questions of do you separate the artists from the art? And, you know, how much do you uh, reward you know, if, if if someone is nominated for an Oscar or in contention and they've done something that, you know, is is morally objectionable or questionable, how much do you factor that in to, you know, to the voting? And, um, uh, you know, it, it almost seems like uh, the Academy needs its own resident rabbi to sort of answer ethical questions. Uh, you know, there are th- th- these quandaries that come up, you know, if someone is, um, you know, s- made an off-color joke at some point, um, do they still, you know, should you should you set that aside and just focus on their performance? And it's these are really not easy questions because they they happen along a, a spectrum of seriousness. And you know, uh, someone like Harvey Weinstein should not be in in the Academy. Of course, he he's in jail now, so being in the Academy is kind of the <laughs> least of his problems. You know, because like the history of Hollywood is so much involved with like the quote casting couch. The casting couch has been so intertwined with the history of Hollywood and the powerful men who um, who ran the studios and the the directors too. Um, so I just wonder, like, if you were to look at Hollywood's past, would like half of the powerful men or more than half be guilty? Like, what would that look like? Yeah, yeah I mean, Hollywood history is inextricable from sexual coercion and assault. I mean, you know, some, you know, the the Columbia Pictures mogul Harry Cohn was absolutely notorious for harassing actresses. Um, you know, Louis B. Mayer, who uh, essentially invented the Academy, he was the very powerful head of MGM. You know, one of the stories about him is that he sort of came on to the actress uh, Anita Page and sort of threatened her Um in so many words, uh, and when she refused him, and then you know she went and asked for a raise, and they basically got rid of her, and her her career uh, quickly ebbed. So you know this is this is a, a tale as old as Hollywood. All right, let's talk about the very beginning of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which administers the Oscars, and only members of the Academy are allowed to vote. That was founded in controversy involving a labor conflict because the studios were terrified of labor organizing. Tell us about that conflict. Right. So uh, the Academy was founded in early 1927. It was the brainchild of Louis B. Mayer, uh, the head of MGM. And uh, the founders were 
basically 36 uh, people who were a cross-section of the powerful people in silent era Hollywood. Um, and their original rhetoric was extremely utopian. They, they saw themselves as a league of nations for for Hollywood. Uh, and much of what they were saying is that they wanted to, you know, create harmony and resolve disputes. And that's sort of the sunny side of what they were doing. Uh, the subtext of that is that Hollywood was not unionized at the time, except for the technical craftspeople. And so the Academy, in a way, was uh, created to preempt you know, equity or some other organizing body from organizing uh, the creative professions. How would the Academy prevent that? Well, basically by creating... Um, a platform for resolving labor disputes that was, you know, ultimately controlled by the powerful. You know, like, for instance, if the writers were negotiating a, a contract with the studios, like the Academy would sort of oversee the contract rather than, you know, a, a labor union doing it. So in its first 10 years, the Academy was really seen as as the enemy by this kind of rank and file in, in Hollywood who felt, you know... It, very much rightly so that they were pre- that they were preempting um, unionization, and in the 30s, uh, these guilds like the Screen Actors Guild and the Screenwriters Guild uh, started to emerge as part of the the labor movement of the 30s of the Depression, and they went to war with the Academy. You know, they would uh, tell their members to resign from the Academy en masse. They would boycott the ceremony. And um, there was a real question that uh, of whether this very young academy would survive. It got to the point where um, the president of the academy at the time, the director Frank Capra, uh, realized how toxic this all was, and he loved the 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 Academy Awards, and uh, he basically said, "Okay, the academy is no longer going to do any of that stuff, any of that negotiating, conflict resolution, anything having to do with you know economics." Um, or contracts, we're just not going to do it anymore. And uh, so they really shed a lot of their original purpose. And what they preserved was the Oscars, which was the only thing that the Academy did that pretty much everyone in Hollywood liked. But the very first ceremony sounds very underwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it was very different. It was a a, a banquet at uh, the Blossom Room of the Roosevelt Hotel. And uh, there was dinner, there were a bunch of speeches, uh, there was academy business, and then uh, at the end there was a basically 15-minute ceremony where they handed out all the awards. Done. <laughs> yeah. And even then, I mean, what fascinates me about the very first Oscars is even even at the beginning, year one, Hollywood was on such shaky ground, you know. Um, for instance... The jazz singer, the the groundbreaking uh, talkie that basically killed off the silent movies, uh, had just come out and it was given an honorary award because the Academy felt it couldn't even compete with all the other nominees, which were silent films. And by the the next year, the second Academy Awards, um, all of the nominees had sound. Is it the first year of the Oscars that there was actually an... Oscar for best title cards, and those are like the captions that you see in silent films. <laughs> yes, Joseph Farnham was the uh, has the distinction of being the first and only winner of best title writing. <laughs> Let's take another break here. If you're just joining us, my guest is New Yorker staff writer Michael Schulman, author of the new book Oscar Wars: A History of Hollywood in Gold, Sweat, and Tears. We'll be right back. This is Fresh Air. Let's talk about um, the anti-communist hysteria of the late 40s and the 50s. Um, In 1947, HUAC, the House on American Activities Committee, started targeting Hollywood because it was afraid that, you know, communists were dominating American broadcasting and telecasting and movies, and that one tactic was to enlist glamorous personalities to appear at communist front meetings and rallies. So as uh, an understanding that Hollywood had a lot of sway over public opinion and, you know, maybe Hollywood can turn America communist. Where the Oscars come in is that some Oscar nominees and some Oscar winners had written their screenplays under pseudonyms because they were blacklisted. So you have this situation where people who are fronts for the actual screenwriters, because the actual screenwriters are blacklisted, are getting up and getting the awards. And, you know, the people who are voting don't even necessarily know who the real writer is. So what are 
some of the crazy outcomes of that? Okay, so this is a Oscar scandal that was a bit lost to history that I absolutely loved. But in 1957, um, the actress Deborah Carr came out and presented uh, the award for Best Motion Picture Story. This category does not exist anymore. Um, to someone named Robert Rich for a movie called The Brave One, uh, which was about a Mexican boy and his pet bull. Um, Robert Rich was not there to receive the award. And after the ceremony, nobody could find him because he was a phantom. He didn't exist. Um, And this became a kind of uh, scandal, a kind of press scandal where everyone in Hollywood was scratching their heads thinking, who is this guy who won this award? And um, the producers of of this movie said, oh, uh, Robert Rich, he was uh, an ex-GI we met in Munich a couple years ago. (laughs) And we bought the story from him. And we we don't know where he is. He might be in Europe. uh, He might be in Australia. Who knows? Um, You know, amazingly, Life magazine actually ran an illustration of what Robert Rich might look like based on the producer's uh, memories of him, you know, like aquiline nose and parted hair and yay high. Um, Of course, Robert Rich turned out to be a front for Dalton Trumbo, uh, who had been uh who was really the most famous uh writer on the blacklist he had been in uh the hollywood 10 uh the the 10 uh blacklisted people who actually went to prison um for defying huac and um so he had exiled himself to mexico for several years went to a bullfight had this idea sold it to uh the producers of this movie and then to his shock because he didn't think it was even that great a, a movie he won this oscar or rather the imaginary robert rich won the oscar so what was dalton trumbo's reaction when this like fictitious name won the oscar and of course nobody was there to accept it because there was no such person he was very amused because, um, first of all, he didn't think very highly of, the, of his own movie. You know, he said, if this is what passes for originality, it tells you, you know, it, it goes to show you what the Academy's idea of originality is. Um, but he realized that it was a golden opportunity to sort of play the press and turn the tables. And so he started uh, like giving interviews where he'd say, well, I might be Robert Rich, or maybe it's my friend Michael Wilson, who is another blacklisted screenwriter. And basically, he used his wit and he used his uh, his words and his his cleverness to sort of fan the flames of this this scandal. Um, and eventually, he managed to manipulate the Academy leaders into rescinding uh, their rule against um, blacklisted people being nominated for Oscars. Uh, it, the rule only lasted two years because the Academy realized it was basically unenforceable. Let's look at where we are today. You were in the balcony at the Oscars the night that Will Smith uh, slapped Chris Rock, and you, you couldn't tell exactly what was going on. You're so deep into the Oscars. Um, you've been deep into them ever since you were a kid. Um, was it exciting for you <laughs> in its own peculiar way to be there for such a kind of dramatic moment that everyone will be talking about for years? Oh, absolutely. So what was interesting about it was that, okay, I was in the balcony. I am very nearsighted. That is important for the story. So <laughs> I couldn't really see what was happening when the slap happened, but I could hear. I could hear perfectly when Will Smith uh, screamed, get my wife's name out in your mouth. And uh, I remember thinking, I don't think you can say that word on network TV. I I think this is real. But um, at home, people who were watching could see but not hear because it was all bleeped out. So I immediately got 20 text messages from people I knew asking what just happened, what just happened. And um, we were just as confused in the room because some people thought, oh, that must have been staged. Some people thought, oh, no, it definitely wasn't. And it took a couple hours to figure out what had actually happened. What has the Academy been trying to do to prevent anything like that from ever happening again outside of um, saying we'll never give Will Smith an Oscar again? Well, they <laughs> they they could give him an Oscar technically. Oh, that's he right. Just they can't give him come. an Oscar. They, they just can't come. That seems like not exactly For 10 a major years. punishment. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you can win the award, but you can't come to the ceremony. Right. <laughs> Or maybe I'll wait it out for 10 years and then come back. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm really curious to watch this year how they address uh, the notorious slap. Um, 
whether the the security will be different. I mean, at the time, there was so much debate over whether they should have, you know, basically escorted him out. Um, instead, he stayed, and then he won Best Actor incredibly and got up and gave this teary, very raw, uh, very emotional speech, um, which, of course, made great television, but it sort of left you to wonder, like, should this be happening? And then the way I ended the night was I went to uh, the Vanity Fair party, and uh, around 12.30 a.m., I decided to just take one last look at the dance floor and then go home and write my story for The New Yorker about the whole night. Um, and I was on the dance floor, and I turned around because I, fe- I felt some something behind me that was getting attention. I turned around, and there was Will Smith three feet away from me holding his new Oscar, dancing, smiling. Uh, his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, was right next to him raising the roof. The DJ started playing uh, Getting Jiggy With It, which was, of course, uh, Will Smith's big hit from the 90s. He started dancing along to him himself and rapping along to his younger self. Uh, 50 phones came out and started recording. And just to watch him like with this big grin, you know, this man who had been through this emotional paroxysm on, you know, in front of everyone uh, live on stage, it was uh, such an unsettling and surreal image. And um, fortunately for me, I was kind of looking for a new ending to the book, and it pretty much wrote itself. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Well, enjoy the Oscars. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> and thank you for doing this. Thank you so much for having me, Terry. New Yorker staff writer Michael Shulman speaking with Terry Gross. Shulman's new book is Oscar Wars, A History of Hollywood in Gold, Sweat, and Tears. The Oscar ceremony is March 12th. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our technical director and engineer is Audrey Bentham. Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, Sam Brigger, Lauren Krenzel, Teresa Madden, Anne-Marie Baldonado, Thea Challoner, Seth Kelly, Susan Yakundi, and Joel Wolfram. Our digital media producer is Molly C.V. Nesper. Roberta Shorrock directs the show. For Terry Gross, I'm Dave Davies.